seated and get comfortable. And uh, what an honor and privilege to be here. Greetings from my wife, who's, I think, looking on. If we're on the internet, hi, Pat. Love you, girl. And, uh, and we'll see what happens. What an honor to be here. Love your pastor. Love his family. Love Antioch, the Apostolic Church. Love you guys. Love what God is doing here and what he's always been doing here. And uh, anyway, praise God. We'll talk about this throughout the weekend. Um, I think that when you, next time you say our, Hisp- our Hispanic daughter work, Pastor, I think you need to say that in Spanish. <laughs> Just a thought. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if, uh, you know, speaking of miracles, <laughs> I don't know if anybody was up praying for me this morning at 3.30, but if you were, I got one for you. I'm tooling along in uh, south central Indiana, 3.30 this morning. Been driving for about an hour, and I'm out in the middle of nowhere, just uh, uh, east of a little quaint little town called Nashville, Indiana. And, um, I mean, just like here, I mean, you know, at nighttime and especially, you know, certain periods of the year, but almost throughout the year, you've got to watch out for deer. And so that's always on my brain, and I'm always trying to scan, but you can only scan so much at 3.30 in the morning. And, uh, and there's a, the, it's just me on a two lane, and I'm pretty much alone. And then, then after, after a little while, there's some headlights that come in behind me at you know, a couple hundred yards. He kind of just lays back there. And then we came to a straight stretch, and I could see that he was coming up to pass. And so he rushes up pretty fast in, a, I think, a small pickup truck. And just as he went, started to go around me, this is a two-lane highway. I got nothing over here for a shoulder. He's got maybe just a little space over there. And just about as he gets even, just as he's getting even, three humongous deer come out from the right side, and they ran in front of our vehicles. And uh, everything kind of slowed down for me because I thought, you know, this was like, this was like the NASCAR thing where the announcer says, uh-oh, they're four wide going into turn three, you know. And uh, there's no room for anybody to do anything, and there's going to be a bust up. And so uh, that's what, that, it, surely enough, that, that was what was going to happen. So these three deer, which were kind of in a group as they emerged, and they, they were trotting out of the woods. And when they, by the time they hit the road, they went single file. And with just enough space, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. He somehow, I mean, he he tried to get away from me as much as he could, and he went between deer number one and deer number two. And I went between, I I braked a little bit and kind of cut a little bit to the right as much as I could, and I went right through between two and three. And we, we all, including the deer, I think, went on our way. And I'm telling you what, it could have been really, really bad. So I was uh, very thankful. So thanks if you were up at 3.30. God bless you. This weekend, if you're here for tonight (laughs) and tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday, you're probably going to hear me mention the word principle quite a few times. I told God that this afternoon in prayer that I don't I, I can't think of anything deeper or bigger or more important perhaps that has helped shape my life in the last several years more than learning and understanding principles that operate in the kingdom of God. There's just certain things that are, that's just the way it is. There are certain principles that kind of jump out at you as you, as you slowly read the word of God. I don't mean like, you know, your little card with bread, you know, where you're 
you know, Bible reading and riches every day, and you're rushing through there so you can tick it off at the end of the year that you read your Bible, and, you know, good for you. I hope you understood at least a little bit of it. But for me, I'd rather look at a little bit and just see as best I can what God is saying in that passage. And there are so many passages that jump out to me as principles of his kingdom. This is who God is. Now, here's, here's a principle. This is probably the most fundamental one that we all know. And that is that God and his word are the same. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And God was the word. He became and the word becomes flesh. What God is is what he does. What God is is what he says. What he says is what he is. He does what he says. He is not like um, just anybody in the earth. Because we have very little integrity left in the earth amongst humans. There is absolutely seemingly no obligation to tell the truth or to justify your actions or to follow through with what you promise. It doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any responsibility attached to those things. Don't ask me why, but that's the way we've come. God's not at all like that. He's always the same. He'll never change. Who he is is what he will always be and do and say. So you'll find in his word that there are principles. And I want, to, I want to talk about those tonight in a kind of a strange passage of scripture. If you want to turn there, uh, I'm going to read the entire chapter of, in the book of Judges, chapter number 17. Because it's a very curious story. And it's very noteworthy. And there are things that we can learn from this. Judges. Chapter number 17, and starting with verse number 1. Now, listen, before we read, I think probably everybody in the room tonight has, at least I hope so, I hope that you've had some now-I-know moments. Okay? I mean, now I know. Now I know this about God. This isn't something that I was told by somebody else talking about the God that he or she knows. This is something that I know now. I've learned this myself. I've seen this. I've recognized it. I've, I've tried to become part of it. And sure enough, God blessed me by his grace. And now I know this. Well, there are several now I know moments in the Bible that are absolutely noteworthy. Let me show you what I mean. Chapter number 17 in Judges, verse number 1. There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And that doesn't sound too strange, but it really is. Because Micah is a Hebrew, it's kind of a shortened version of a question. And the question is, who is like Yahweh? That's what his name means. Who is like Yahweh? That's a good question. And you can almost, I mean, you know how... You know, if, you, if you've read your Bible very much and you've contemplated these kind of things, you know that Hebrew names and, and, and names continuing on into the New Testament have certain significance in people's lives. There's a lot of symbolism that we read from people's names and what they do or what they fail to do in their lives. Well, who is like Yahweh? And maybe, maybe his dad and, gave him, and his mom gave him that name because they were hoping that this little boy would be like Yahweh. But who is like Yahweh? Who is really like God? We say, I mean, if you pray like I do sometimes, I will often hear myself saying in prayer to God, I will tell him that there's none like you, Lord in all the earth. And what I mean by that is, there's never going to be one of us who matches up to the greatness and the depth and the perfection and the holiness and the righteousness of our Lord God and Savior. So who's like him? Now, there is a divine nature. The Apostle Peter tells us 
deeply about how we should and can become partakers of his divine nature. There are, I don't know if you call them characteristics, but there are, there are parts of God that are defined by the apostle as part of his spiritual makeup. And those things can become part of us. So in some ways, it's as if we can be a little bit more like Yahweh. But the bottom line is, and in Judges 17, and at the birth of this little boy named Micah, there was nobody like Yahweh. And there is absolutely no way in this chapter is there anything that even resembles God in the life and ministry of this guy named Micah. But that's the way it starts. There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was, who is like Yahweh. And Micah says unto his mother, the 11, the, Mom, there's a, those 1,100 shekels of silver that were stolen from you. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. This is the Grossbach paraphrase. The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which thou cursest. So what's happened? She's had 1,100 shekels of silver. That's quite a, quite a lot of booty there, okay? Can you see? That's the old, anyway, okay. You know, like pirate, anyway, okay, like pirates. They were stolen from her. And Micah, Micah has heard his mother curse the thief that stole them. Now, this is a time, we're going to read it, this is a, this is a difficult time in, in Israel. And uh, this, this curse is a, is a thing, it's kind of like an African curse that people are terribly afraid of. I mean, there are, still, there are still witch doctors, I mean, not with bones through their nose and that kind of, but there, there are still witch doctors in Africa of whom people are terrified. They have magic. And as long as people believe that magic and, you know, they, 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 get, they just become part and parcel of what the devil is doing through these kind of operators, then terrible things happen to these kind of people. Just to put a stamp on how evil and powerful Satan really is. Scared to death. Well, Micah's scared because he's the one that stole it. He says to his mother, you know, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you about which you cursed and spakest of also in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. I'm coming clean because I've heard you place this curse on the thief. So I'm just confessing it was just me, mom. And his mother said, well, blessed be thou of Yahweh, my son. These are some strange people. These are strange times. Well, you, you know, well, son, that's good. It's good that you stole it. I'm glad to hear that because it's really all about you anyway. Verse 3, he gives it back to his mom. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated, it's okay, because I had wholly dedicated the silver unto Yahweh from my hand for my son. Why? So that he could make a graven image and a molten image. Of whom? Of God, of Yahweh, of something. I had collected all this silver and I set aside this silver for my son so that he could go down to the guy that makes things out of silver. They could melt it down and he could make his own God. Great chapter. This is a great chapter. So, verse 4, he restores the money unto his mother. And his mother took 200 shekels of that silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of who is like Yahweh. They put these images in the house of Micah. They, they, they melted this stuff, shaped this stuff, formed this stuff, and set it up in Micah's house. Verse 5. And the man Micah, who was like Yahweh, had a house of gods. And he made an ephod and a teraphim. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now he's got the images of these gods. Now he needs a priest. And he needs to dress the priest in priestly ro in apparel. And so he makes this stuff. And then he finds a priest. 
He finds one of his own sons and appoints him in his house to be the priest of his house. Verse 6, interestingly enough, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man simply, there's a little bit of paraphrase there, every man simply did that which was right in his own eyes. Then it gets even more involved. Coincidentally, coincidentally, it seems almost like a blessing. All of a sudden, on what they're doing, oh, there's this blessing. Because out of nowhere, verse 7, a young man out of Bethlehem of the family of Judah who was a Levite, he was one of the Levites. Remember the Levites? Good. And he sojourned. He, all of a sudden, he just shows up. He shows up at Micah's house. I mean, he, he's got his son as a priest, but now a Levite potential priest shows up. And the man departed out of the city of, from Bethlehem, Judah, to, to sojourn, listen to this, where he could find a place. It sounds like a modern day, and excuse, I mean, I'm not pointing at anybody, I'm just kind of saying this, but it sounds like kind of some of these, uh, these uh, traveling evangelist types. He's looking for a place to preach. This guy leaves Bethlehem, and he's looking for a gig somewhere. And he just happens to make his way to the door where, who's like Yahweh lives. So he comes to Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said unto him, where do you come from? And he said unto him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. And I'm just going to see where I can find a place. I'm looking for a gig. And Micah said unto him, well, just dwell, live with me. And be unto me, listen to this, be unto me a father and a priest. Be unto me a father and a priest. But listen, and I will give you ten shekels. Be a father and a priest, but I'll pay you. And I'll feed you. And I'll give you stuff to wear. And you can be my priest. And you can be a father unto me. In other words, I'll sit at your feet and listen to what you counsel with me. I'll listen to you talk to me about God. But I'll pay you. And you'll live in my house. And you'll eat what I give you. And you'll wear what I, what I give you. You know, it's like one of those little, you know, things on the strings. Got my own priest. And the Levite was content. Perfect, the perfect gig to live with the man. And the young man was unto him like one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. And the young man became his priest. And he was in the house of who was like Yahweh. Verse 13, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Because there's not one, there's not one that is, <laughs> thus saith who is like Yahweh. Now, now I know that the Lord will do me good because I have a Levite as my priest. Just a little history here. Judges 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Those five chapters probably are not in the right place chronologically. They seem to be have kind of attached to the end of the writings for a reason that I won't go into tonight, okay? Where they should be is back towards Judges 2. They should be right after Joshua dies. Chapter 2, listen to this. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I've made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, God said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. And you shall throw down their altars, but you've not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore I said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words unto the, all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and they wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had led the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. They didn't do a full job of that. I got a little note that I wrote, I don't know when. And it says, not possessing equals not believing. 
And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. They served God while Joshua was showing them what to do. And then they continued to serve God under the next kind of the next generation that were closely involved with Joshua. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the son of the servant, the son, the servant of the Lord, died being 110. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Hires, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. They knew not the Lord. How is that possible? They knew not the Lord. Not yet the works which he had done for Israel. They didn't even know the works that God had done for Israel. How is that even possible? That's what we were talking about before church, Mark. How is that possible? How could just a couple of generations after Joshua not even know the stories of what happened in in the Exodus? Nobody knew about the Red Sea. Nobody knew about the manna. Nobody knew about the water from the rock. Is that even possible? (laughs) If you walk through the Red Sea, do you think you can forget that? Or is that supposed to be a now I know moment? Well, you know, I mean, but you know how you know how people think. You know how people think. They walk through it. Oh, 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 whoa. They get on the other side. Whoa, 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 whoa. And now, now they don't have any meat to eat. They don't have any onions. They don't have any leeks. No garlic. Just manna. And so the thing about, the, about walking through on dry land doesn't seem to, it just kind of, it, it loses its priority. The now I know moment is taken over by other things that I know which don't have anything to do with what God does. They don't include any of his principles whatsoever. They're based on our principles. Stay with me. The children of the Lord did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves to them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and they served Baal and Ashtaroth. And that's where Micah's story comes in right there. That's where it should be placed chronologically because that's the condition of Israel at the time that we read in Judges chapter number 17. It's a curious story. Who's like Yahweh? Who's like Yahweh? And the guy says at the, at the end of that chapter, he says, now, now I know that the Lord will do me good because I have a Levite unto me and as my priest. That strange theft from his own mother. Is Micah's fear and his confession when, when, he, when he hears her cursing the, the thief. His, his mother's strange dedication of the silver to the Lord. And it's like... It's like she's giving this gift to God. She's she's been reserving this silver to give to Yahweh, but it's got strings attached to it. I'm going to give this to God, but here's what it's going to be used for. I can't just give it to God because I love Him. I'm going to give it to God because I know what He can do with it. I know how He can bless me. I know what I should get out of this. I've done this in my own design. Micah has a house of gods. These were, these were tough times. These were wicked times. There were evil people at every turn. There, were, there, were, there was evil in the land. You never knew who was around the corner. You never knew who was going to come and, and take down your house and, and, and kill you. These were evil times. There was no king in the land. Desperate measures. Desperate measures fueled Micah's quest for three things. He wanted blessing, he wanted protection, and he wanted prosperity. And interestingly enough, I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of Christians that want those three things. And almost all of their existence, all of the energy they expend in the kingdom of God, in one way or another, 
is, is in the quest for blessing and protection and prosperity. So, what he needed, what he needed, what all Micah needed, really, 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 he just needed a temple, and he needed a priest, and he needed an ephod, and he needed an image of his God. And there was, you know, that, like I said, there was no king in Israel. There was no king in Israel to provide those three things for the people. There was nobody to stand in the place of God to make sure that it, that it happened in Israel like it should. And yet in reality, all along, the whole time, there was a king in Israel. And they wouldn't let him be king. So like I said, miraculously, miraculously in Micah's eyes, the Levite showing up in his door that was a gift of God. That was a stamp of approval on his plan. There's stuff that happens to you that you think is, this is obviously God giving me a stamp of approval. You, listen, if it's not springing from a principle that's in the kingdom of God, you better watch what it is. And you better learn those principles so you can discern what is right. You know what? I was praying before, before this afternoon, and I, I told God, as I have often, I've often petitioned him on this, and as I did it today, I, I just I, I said, I've got to tell Annie, I've got to confess. Because I don't know how many times in my exhortations here I have said something to the effect of, we need to be real. We need to be real. And Antioch, the apostolic church, needs to be real in who they are. Doesn't need to be trumped up. Doesn't need to be exaggerated. No hyperbole here. We need to discover who God is. And when we really discover who He is, we find out where, who we are and where we fit in the kingdom. Then we know who we are and what He wants to do in us and through us. Then things happen. They happen the way that God wants them to happen. And we don't look for a knock on the door from something that looks good and something that looks heaven sent. What in actual fact is nothing but a charade. This guy, this Levite, is completely spiritually bankrupt. Now here's your homework assignment. If you really want to dig, if you really want to explore something fun, Find out who this guy is. Find out who this this young Levite is. He's the grandson of somebody that we all know and love. A great man of God. And in two generations, this guy is bankrupt. I'm looking for a gig. I'm looking for a place to preach. And I'll go anywhere and I'll preach whatever the guy pays me to preach. I told my wife just the other day, I said, you know, the irony sometimes of of one of the things that we say so often, brother, is that, you know, we we like to quote the... uh, Paul telling Timothy that, uh, you know, in the last days there'll be people having itching ears. They would heap to themselves teachers. They would heap to themselves teachers because the ones heaping the teachers to themselves, they need to have their ears scratched just the way they want them to scratch. So they'll find people that tell them what they want to hear. And we use that to blast other organizations that don't have the truth like we do. But we do the exact same thing. And the easiest stuff sometimes to swallow and to run around and jump and shout about is stuff that is just absolutely of no import whatsoever. But it makes us, it scratches the ears just right. 
And somehow, it's almost always tied to blessing, protection, and prosperity. Hello, who are you? I'm a, I'm a priest and I'm looking for a gig. Come on in. And I'll give you stuff. And you can live here. And you can tell me what I, what I need to hear and what I want to hear. And you'll be well paid. And everybody was happy in the deal except God. Because who is like Yahweh? Nobody in this story. This Levite is just a... It's just a priest wannabe. He's a fake. He has nothing inside. But he has a good lineage. He comes from good stock. He has a genuine pedigree. He was the grandson of Moses. He was really nothing more than a hireling though at this point. Just a hireling. Grandson of Moses. Grandson of the guy who stood on the banks of the Red Sea and raised his staff and parted the waters. Grandson. And now he's knocking on the door looking for a gig. So everything's fallen in place, Micah, just the way you wanted it. There's no accountability. First you appoint your son to be priest. How's that going to work? I rebuke you, Father. No, you don't. No accountability under, you know, the priest was going to be under his control. And then as soon as the Levite knocks on his door, son's out, Levite's in, but he's paid, he's on salary. Do it the way I, everything will be happy. Okay, I'm just looking for a gig. So it seems like he can proudly and with seemingly great faith declare in verse 13. That's why I said that last verse in chapter 17 is one of the greatest in the Bible because it's such an absolute bold, 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 is it bold-faced lie or just an absolute lie. Now I know that God will do me good. You don't have a clue, pal. You don't know at all. So let 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 me close with this, okay? Five ways. Now we get to the nitty gritty, okay? Five ways. Here's five principles. Here's five. Here's just five. And there's dozens and dozens. You're going to find dozens and dozens. And the more you read and the more you see what these principles are, Paul writes to the Philippians and says, he says, For it is God which worketh in us. Both to what? Will and do of his good pleasure. That's a principle. It's God which works in us. Both to will and do of his good pleasure. That's a principle. You can bank on that. You can go to God and pray that verse. God, I know it's you that works in me. Help me. To to will. Help me to have the same will. Help me to carry out your will and do what pleases you. That's a kingdom principle. Learn them. See them. Recognize them. Understand them. Learn them. And then begin to pray with them. Think with them. Make decisions with them. Discern good and evil by them. Discern truth by them. And when some knuckle-headed, bankrupt Levite shows up at the door and gives you a bunch of rubbish, which sounds good and tickles most ears, somebody will say, that doesn't fit in the kingdom of God. That's not real. Sounds good, but it doesn't do anything. It's fake, it's bogus, it's wrong. Here's five. A lot of you know this story well, I'm sure. The rest of you just need to catch up, okay? I'm not going to tell the story. The great Syrian general, Naaman, sick with leprosy. He sent down, you know, anyway, he sent down to to, uh, the prophet in Israel's house. 
The prophet tells him to go and dip in the Jordan River seven times and everything will be okay. He'll be healed of leprosy. He just absolutely agonizes over that command. That's just horrible. He's a general. He's tough. He's a man's man. He's got scars all over him from battles he's fought and won. And you're going to tell him to go let it dip down like some, some ignoramus in, the, in front of all of his troops? Dip down in this muddy river so that he can get healed? Whew. But he does. And he gets healed. And not only does he get healed, but when he comes up out of the water and his skin is perfectly made whole, what does he say? Now I know. Now I know that there's no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now I know. How does he know? He knows through complete surrender and a total humility in front of God. If you're going to know anything about God, if you're going to know anything about God, it's going to have to come through real humility and total surrender unto Him. Now I know. He went home. He went back to Syria with that faith. He asked God, he asked the prophet for a dispensation so that when he got back and he's helping the king of Syria go down to his temple to worship his gods and the the king needed help from his general. He asked for a dispensation from the prophet. Back in Israel, when I do that, is, is it, I mean, is it okay? Will, will God, will the real God understand? Don't worry, just, just, it's okay. He went back with a real faith. He was a new man. He found a savior. How many of you, how many of you, I know Sister Lori and, and some of you others were, you were at the, 1995 crusade in in Zambia. You remember on Sunday morning we had General Shikapwasha. What a name. Big God. Bigger bigger than I am. Shikapwasha. He was the commanding officer of the Zambian Air Force. He was like this with the president. He was a big guy. I mean big in stature and big in rank. He came in this fancy suit. One of those shark skin suit things, kind of silvery in color. And he said, I, I didn't know what to do with him because he was such a VIP. I'm just a lunkhead. You know? So I, I put him up on the platform. Remember that? He was up on the platform, he and his wife. His wife was a Christian to some degree and was very close to one of the sisters in our church. Anyway, we gave the altar call, and we're lining, you know, 1,200 or 1,500 people up, lining them in rows so we can pray for them to receive the Holy Ghost, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're doing all this stuff, you know, and I hear this voice behind me and he says, and says excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Reverend, excuse me, excuse me. And I turned, it was Sheikha Pasha. I said, yes, sir. He says, aren't you going to invite me? I felt like an idiot. I said, of course, come, please. Put him right up here, you know, right in the front, right front line, you know. And we start praying. And I mean to tell you, whew, God was moving. And we went over there and I laid my hands on him and some some others were praying with him. Anyway, under the power of God, he just goes, boom, falls straight back, pow, in his nice suit and everything, in front of his soldiers. You should have seen the the entourage that he came with. He had like five or six Toyota Land Cruisers with AK-47 sticking out of all the windows, you know, guarding this guy. And now he's gone, boom, on his back in the dirt, in the middle of a soccer field, and not just on the soccer field, but on the white stripe, the chalk. Right on the chalk, boom. Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. Why? Because in that moment, it it wasn't about his position. It wasn't about his suit. It wasn't about the guards. It was Naaman in the Jordan River. Anyway, he went on to great things and started the church and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Psalm number 20. Psalm 20. Listen to this. Well, I won't turn there. Psalm 20 in verse. Psalm 20 is, some people consider it a prayer. It's a prayer. It's a Psalm of David. And some people consider it a prayer, a general prayer that David wrote for the kings of Israel, all future kings in Israel. 
And in verse number 6 of Psalm 20, he says this, Now I know, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Talking about the king. But let's broaden that. Let's, let's take that and make it, make it applicable today. Let's see if there's a principle in here. I know, now I know that the Lord saves the people that are anointed for service in his kingdom. You've heard me say it over and over, probably. And I know you forget it as soon as I say it, probably. But I, you've heard me say this a lot. There is no anointing. There is no anointing in the kingdom of God except for service. It's not for importance. It's not to look good. It's not to get a title. It's not to be called something. You're anointed to serve in ministry. That's it. Well, I'm anointed. Well, good for you. What are you doing? You got a title. You got a position. You got all this stuff, you know, but you're doing nothing. That's anointing. That's modern day anointing, but it's not Bible anointing. I know, David says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He saves his anointed. He's not always going to save the lunkhead. He may or may not. He may just let him lunk out. But he'll save his anointed. Because they're doing something. There's a ministry, there's a service in the kingdom that God anointed them for. And he'll save them. Now listen, he will hear, that's what the King James says, he will hear him from, from his holy heaven. Well, hear actually is the word, he'll answer them. He will answer that anointed from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. In other words, there's a principle that says, in service for God, when I come to one of those battles, I'm not just talking about any battle. I'm not talking about, you know, I didn't, I didn't pay my bills, and so now I'm in the, you know, I'm in lunkhead, you know, tax problems and everything else. I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. My life is totally a wreck because I've been living completely out of order. And now I want God to rescue me. He may and he may not. He may let you crash and burn a little bit before he rescues you. He'll rescue you one way or the other. But he's talking about people that are serving him. Serving him in a direct anointing for ministry. And when that guy fights a battle, David had no doubt in his mind. David had no doubt in his mind when he looked at Goliath. He knew why he was standing there. He knew why David had brought the bread and the cheese. He knew that. I'm not here by accident. I'm here to stand up where nobody else can stand up. He knew that. In 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 17, the story of Elijah and part of his journey, you know, and, and he's, the ravens have fed him and during this drought and he's you know, had to drink from a brook and all this kind of stuff. And, and then God tells him to go to a place called Zarephath and he's going to find a woman there. And he finds, he finds a woman and, and uh, just she and her young son. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the, give me, I've only got enough to feed me and my son. And he says, well, make me a, a piece of bread first and then you have what's left. And she does it. She does it. And they survive. And they keep going to the, to the meal and the oil. And it's always there. They always have enough. And then it came to pass that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there wasn't even any breath left in him. Now see what this story speaks to you. And so she said unto Elijah, and the King James makes it sound rough. But she's not being rough. She's just, she's just broken her heart is broken in utter sorrow because the thing that she loves most, the thing most dear to her has been taken. And so she says, 
Is, is this what it comes to? It's, it's come to you. I mean, you came here and, and there was a miracle of the, of, the, of the meal and the oil and we lived and it, it was impossible. But God kept providing this because you were, you were the man of God. But now it's come to this and my, now my, the dearest, the thing that I love the most, my very life is, is just taken away from me. And he says, give me your son. Give me your son. Give me your dead son. John 11. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Martha and Mary are crying about Lazarus. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Let me tell you something. You'll never die. You'll never die. And what is nearest and dearest to you in the will of God it may look like it's dead. I'm not, I'm not talking about some, some weird promise. I'm not trying to resurrect some kind of promise. And I'm, not, what, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that the real, whatever it really is, whatever the real thing is that you think is in the process of dying or it's already dead, if it's, if it's from God, it'll never die. It'll never die. I'm the resurrection and the life. And he that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So Elijah says to her, give me your son. You're agonizing about you. Give me your son. And he takes the son into a chamber and lays the son on, on the prophet's own bed. Comes back to life. And he comes back out to the woman and he says, see, here's your son. That's a principle in the kingdom of God. But you got to know what that son is. Don't play games with God about something that is not the nearest and dearest thing. The real you in the kingdom, for example. The real you. People trash it all the time. Preachers spend half of, their, half of their energy trying to resurrect promises to people and try to, to tell them over and over again how God really considers them important in their lives. I mean, in the ministry and in, in the work of God. And people just let it die. They let it die. And all the time, God is saying, give me your son. Jethro. Moses' father-in-law. After Moses has recounted to his father-in-law everything that happened during the Exodus up until the point they got to Jethro's house. When Jethro hears this, he says this. He says, now I know. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, the other gods, the other people with their other gods. For in the thing that they, wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. That's a principle in the kingdom of God. People are always surrounding us and bombarding us with things that are supposed to be more important than what we are in the kingdom. Life's responsibilities. This is what I deserve. This is what I want. This is what everybody else does. These are just other gods that other people serve. But God is above all of this. And here's the thing. Here's the principle. It's when we see and where we understand and where we know how and when and why God is doing what he's doing. This is paramount for leaders. We need to, we, we need to learn what God is doing and why he's doing it that way. As much as we can. We need to recognize it when we see it happening. Leaders have to recognize this when they see it happening. 
in a, in, a, in, a, in a place like Antioch, the Apostolic Church, this is probably one of the best. I was going to say the one of the easiest places, but it's never easy. But it's certainly a place where you, could, you can learn this. You can see what God is doing and why He's doing it. Not only is He touching people individually every time we congregate or every, every time we go out from here and we do what we do in ministry. He's not just doing it individually. He's doing it corporately. Something's happening amongst this team of leaders and core members here that would give everything they have for the privilege and the pleasure of walking with God in this kind of ministry. That's where things happen. And we can see them happening. And we can understand why God is doing it like that. And What does that do in the future? We see where God is going to do it again. And we can stand sure with people like the pastor and other senior leaders and say, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. We've seen God do this before. I know what he's doing here. I see this. In Acts chapter 12, Peter's in prison. He's been assigned to death. And he's, he's, he's resigned himself to death. Seems to me in Acts chapter 12, I mean, James is already dead. Now they're going to get Peter. Peter's pretty sure they're going to kill him. He's chained between two soldiers in the dungeon. He's, I mean, he's, he, he's prayed his, you know, his, his last prayers. He's good. He's good. He's ready to go. It's better on the other side. He's given to that. I may close my eyes down here, but I'll open them in heaven. He's ready to go. And all of a sudden, an angel comes and wrecks everything. Get up. Get out. You know, we, we claim that he was just, he was so sleepy that he, he kind of dragged around not knowing what was. No, no, he was just absolutely overcome with the, with the thought of going back to the reality of this life. But God had something to do. And the way that he rescued him at this time is noteworthy. Because there's a principle in this. The principle is that even sometimes in the most unexpected ways, the will of God gets carried out in our journey with Christ when we don't have a clue about what God is doing. There's times when we know it. There's times when leaders can agree that, hey, this is what God is doing here in Antioch. But there's times in your own life for mature saints where you just kind of wake up one day and say, wow, that's what that was all about. You weren't, you, weren't, you, weren't, you weren't just second-guessing all the way through it. You weren't just trying to fill in the blanks with your own wisdom. You were just waiting on God and watching it all unfold. Lord willing, Lord willing, Lord willing, that's what I want to talk about on Sunday morning. The times when we just don't have a clue. So, Micah, what really is a blessing or protection or prosperity? Well, let me tell you something. Blessings are not defined by us. They are not defined. Well, they are all the time, I know. But in the kingdom, they're not defined by us. You've heard enough teaching around here to know that (laughs) probably... That you're making a mistake when you ask God to bless something that you shouldn't be asking him to bless. And now bless our time together, Jesus. You know, and you're not even supposed to be there together. <laughs> Blessings aren't defined by us. But I'll tell you what, they're discovered. They're discovered by us with God's divine perspective. When we see it the way God sees it, that's a blessing. Oh, that. That's what he's doing. That's why he's doing it. That's why I received that. That's why I didn't receive that. That's why they hated me. That's why they talked about me. That's why they didn't like me on my Facebook page. Okay, Micah, what about protection? Protection doesn't come from an ephod. It doesn't come from an image. 
It doesn't come from a cross you wear around your neck. But it lies in being submitted to, to the precious will of God. I'm just, I'm just here in the will of God. I wish I had a video. I wish I had a, I wish I would a Hollywood quality movie about my wife and I physically transplanting ourselves into the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> Without knowing where to go, didn't have a house. I mean, where are we going to have, where are we going to live? Who do you trust? There's scam artists every place. There were people that'll tell you this. They don't have any right to sell you this or, or to rent you a house. They'll take your first, you know, two thousand dollar deposit, and you'll never see them again. Or when you go, and then somebody else shows up and say, "What are you doing in the house?" Well, I rented it from whom? We don't know those people. Well, go to court. Oh, that'll get you somewhere, because whoever pays the judge most wins the case. What do you do? Where do you get a house? We find a house. It's broken down. It's a it's a piece of junk. We put up a tent. We live in a tent in one of the little bedrooms for like three weeks. Because that was the only, that was our place. That was our little place. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Nobody taught me how to go and transplant yourself in, in the Congo. What do you do? What do you do with your wife? Who deserves better than this? What do you do? You just think, hey, I know this. <laughs> We're here in the will of God. I hope, like the now I know moments, I hope that you have a, a little catchphrase or some little thing that you've already learned about how God kind of speaks to you or talks to you or shows you that special little thing at just the right moment. I got one. I got a catchphrase that works for me. I mean, it, it, there's a zillion other people it works for, I'm sure, as well. But it works for me, and it's happened over and over and over. And it's simply this. Everything's going to be all right. So I will unabashedly try to encourage other people. Sometimes simply by saying, I want you to know something. One way or the other, everything's going to be all right. Come back Sunday morning. Michael, what about prosperity? Seems like it's the objective these days of so many Christians and leaders. But it's actually nothing more than, it's, it's just simply an abundance that God supplied and intended for his purpose. That's all it is. We're, you know, I like baby, baby dedications. I do, I, I really do. I like, to have, I like to have the father, if he's there, I like to have the father take the baby in his arms, and I, I like to have the father pray for the kid. I like to, have, I like to put the microphone in, in his mouth. I want you to pray for this baby, because I want to hear him make a few vows. I want some tears to run down his face. I remember when Blue Dean was born. <laughs> and I just. <sighs> this is a baby who doesn't know anything. And he can't do anything without us. He can't do anything. Utter dependence. Utter dependence. Let the little children come unto me, Jesus said. Because they, see, even when they don't know it, they are in utter dependence of us. They love Jesus because they didn't try to figure anything out. They just knew that he was the king of something. And they wanted whatever he had. So, you know, at the end of all this, Micah 
Read the story. I mean, go, go into Judges 18, and everything that Micah gathered is stripped. It's all, he's, he's ripped off. These, these, these marauders come from the tribe of Benjamin, and they take everything they've got, that he's got. They take his images, and they take his wannabe priest. Who has a better gig with the Benjamites? They tell him, would you rather be the priest of one guy or to, to a thousand guys? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm with you. There he goes. Micah loses everything. But when in losing all this, we also, we can remember another principle that Jesus spoke to us after the, the parable of the sower and the seed. I think it's in Mark's gospel where Jesus says to them that who stayed to hear the explanation, he tells them to, Take heed what they hear. But in Luke's version, Luke says, take heed how you hear. So I think we're going to talk about principles a little bit this weekend. Principles that change lives. Principles that you can build on. Principles that you can stand by. Principles that you can go with. Principles that you can minister by. Praise God. Let's stand. Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I know one thing. I know one thing, and I learned it a long time ago, God. That very first night, Lord, at that altar on that church in Windsor Avenue, when I didn't even know how to pray, I said this unto you, Jesus, and I've stuck with it ever since. Because I realized then, Lord, in that moment, I knew that you were God and I wasn't. And so I was sorry for all the things I'd done against the one and true living God. Now I know you, Lord. Now I've seen you in action. I've seen you work. I've seen you bring something out of nothing, Lord. Praise God. And I know this, Lord. I know this. I know something about Antioch, the apostolic church. I know about the promises here. I know how you're seeking every single day, every moment of every day for for a stronger nucleus in this church than ever before that will stand and be exactly the people that you're making them to be. They will stand for you, heart, soul, mind, and strength. That they will find in your word principles of your kingdom, Lord, by which they can live and prosper and be blessed and protected in the true sense of your kingdom. Oh God, I know that without you we can do nothing. But there's a principle connected to that in that kind of surrender and humility. Even though without you we can do nothing, Lord, with you we are more than conquerors because you've loved us, Jesus. Fill us, God, to overflowing. Move in us and through us, O God, by the power of your Spirit. And help us become discerners of what's right and wrong. Help us to hear the truth, Lord God, and shun the lies. Help us grasp what is real, God, and turn away from that which is false. And let us grow into the Christians, Lord God, of which the Apostle Peter spoke when he exhorted the church to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fill us, God. Use us. Send us, O Lord. Minister in us and through us, God. Help us to grow. Help us to grow. Help us to grow. And Lord Jesus, help this congregation be real in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh God, bless the leaders of this church. God, from the bishop, Lord, and to the pastors and to the senior leaders, Lord God, and to every leader in every department, to every single saint that ministers to others, Jesus, let your grace abound in them and pour your spirit through them, God. 
Help us do your will. God, work in us both the will and do of your good pleasure. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now I know. Now I know, Lord. You know, I didn't say it, but when Elijah took that baby back, you know, burned him, watched him come back to life and brought him back to the mother and give me your son and then see, here's your son. She said, Now I know that the words that you speak, the words that come out of your mouth are the words of God. She kind of knew it before because the oil and the meal. But when she lost the dearest thing she knew and then had it restored by the prophet, she knew when, because those two things he said, give it to me. Life, and he gives it back. See, here's your son. Then she knew that this guy was sent by God. Help us hear. Help us hear what God is really saying to us as the church and as individuals. Help us hear and help us say of of a surety, now I know. Oh, God. That's, what, that's one thing that I remember so much about, about being a saint here. Front row, front row guys. You're right here. I mean, you're right here. And the guy's preaching right here. <laughs> and he's saying stuff right here. And he says something that you know and discern. That is exactly what God is doing. You know it. You see it bringing life to this thing. And you say, I know that what's being spoken is exactly the truth. Now, I know, I know that we're trained. I know we're trained to just take everything that comes out of everybody's mouth because we're all good saints and we all just love God and everybody's happy in the kingdom. But people flub the dove from time to time. But there's things that people say that you know it's the word of God. Because it brings life. Give me your son. See, here's your son. Back to life. Praise God. Antioch. You know what I heard on the radio today? Today was high five day. But they, they make up stuff for every day. So give somebody a high five and say, let's be real.